Hi, I'm Richard Morris from Canberra, Australia. In 2014, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. After taking the dietary advice of the Australian Diabetes Association, I became more diabetic. I did some research which led me to the ketogenic diet. Spoiler alert, I reversed my type 2 diabetes by drastically reducing my carbohydrate intake and increasing my consumption of healthy fats. In 2016, I was determined to help my buddy Carl, showing him what I did and the science behind it. Hey, y'all. I'm Carl Franklin from the United States. I also used to be a type 2 diabetic, but not as severely as Richard. I devoured all the information Richard sent me. And after a mutual friend of ours went keto to address prostate cancer, Mm -hmm. I also went on the ketogenic diet. And that was in February of 2016. But by April, I was already in full swing reversing my diabetes. Yeah, we're not doctors and we don't give medical advice. We're just a couple of dudes on the internet who reverse their diabetes by following a ketogenic diet. Yeah, we just want to share our experiences and what we know about the science behind the ketogenic diet. Yeah, so we started this podcast to chronicle Carl's journey and to provide some solid information to those curious about this dietary lifestyle. Right. And now we have over 200 podcast episodes, some of mm-hmm. which have been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. <laughs> yep. After failing on Facebook, we moved mm-hmm. our online community to the ketogenic forums, where tens of thousands of people share their experiences every day. We also founded an annual ketogenic festival called Keto Fest. Carl and I are both software developers, and as such, we found ourselves at software conferences several times a year. And we tend to gravitate towards the conversations that happen in the hallways at a conference rather than the presentations. Sure, talks are great, but it's the community that we enjoy the most. So Keto Fest was meant to be a conference to discuss the latest research of the ketogenic diets, but it's also very much a festival celebrating the ketogenic lifestyle. Yeah. So, Carl, what is a ketogenic diet? Well, it's a diet where instead of burning sugar and starch for energy, our cells preferentially burn fat. And that produces molecules called ketones that our bodies use for fuel. Right. Our primary molecular fuels are glucose, which we make from carbohydrates, and fatty acids, which we make from fat. Our cells have two modes. In one, they burn glucose and make fat. And in the other, they burn fatty acids and make ketones. Right. But you don't have to eat a high-fat diet to be ketogenic, right? When you're starting out, you may have to, but then in a few weeks, as you become better adapted to burning fat for energy, when all of your calories come from fatty acids, the amount you need to eat becomes coupled to satiety, which integrates not only the variable amount of energy your body needs to run every day, but also the amount of fat that can be drawn down from storage. So how many carbohydrates do we need to restrict ourselves to in order to get into that state? Well, it depends. Some of us who are metabolically disordered need to get below 20 grams a day. Somebody who's quite metabolically flexible may be able to eat as much as 100 grams a day. Okay. How about other nutrients like protein, minerals, and essential cofactors like vitamins and essential fats? Well, you need from one to one and a half grams of protein for every kilo of lean mass. And beyond that, you just waste the excess by turning it into energy instead of using fatty acids. As for the other essential nutrients, if you're eating fatty meats or eggs plus leafy green vegetables, you'll get most of those uh, because those organisms that made those foods have already concentrated essential cofactors. Ketogenic diets are varied and delicious. Mm. They can be vegetarian or carnivore, home cooked or takeout. Hot cuisine. Hot cuisine. Hot cuisine. Or just bacon and eggs. As long as your carbohydrates are low enough. And if you're an absolute beginner, check out our Starting Keto podcast for more information at start.2keto.com. Well, my buddy Richard, how are you doing? How was your week? Yeah, I pretty good. We're still in lockdown. We had uh, 30 cases in my state today. Um, which wow. for some places doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, for uh, there was at one point we only had one case. Now, remember, we pretty much haven't had much COVID at all because we locked down our borders mm. March last year in 2020. And so we are essentially the same as the U.S. was. We're a, na- a population naive to the, to the pathogen um, with, with an index case. Uh, our index case was like um, on the 12th of August and it's uh, currently the 26th of August. So that's two weeks ago exactly. Mm. And uh, so we're like um, two weeks into the the epidemic in uh, – so Washington had one case to start off with in the US and then sort of 14 days later they, they were, had 30 or 40 cases. And, mm-hmm. you know, with it, within a month, if you don't do something about it, it's uh, it goes – you know, you, you're talking about 5,000 cases a day in the state – 
But the good news is that uh, we pretty much locked down as soon as there was one case, plus mm. we've got people vaccinated. I'm currently at peak neutralising immunity, uh, so I'm two weeks from my second vaccination. Uh, so uh, we're in a lot better situation than, than the US was at the same point in the epidemic. So, right. but yeah, no, I'm 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 okay. I'm just uh, working on, I've got I'm working on a technical paper for on mitochondria, mitochondrial membranes, and uh, uh, for publication and uh, doing other work in in the lab. But uh, other than that, things are pretty good. How about you, mate? I'm doing okay. I'm feeling great. I'm looking forward to having Emmy, my daughter, over tonight for an oven roasted pernil, which is that a nice. slow cooked pork shoulder. Mm. with garlic, lemon, cumin seed, oregano, salt, and pepper. Can't mm. wait. Nice. Nice. <laughs> oh, also, I bought, you know, some people are asking, hey, where did the list of your recipes go with all those links? Mm. And, uh, yeah, absolutely right. We we lost those in the new website. Uh, so, um, no, we didn't lose them, but they're not on the new website. So, basically, right. I'm bringing them back. And okay, uh, cool. by the time you hear this, you should be able to go to two keto dudes.com slash recipes and see all the old links. Nice. And that brings us squarely to the realm of. I'm getting the last word mail. Yes, you have the last word, my friend. All right. Well, anyway, this one comes from the forum, as many of our mail uh, Mm -hmm. messages do these days. And this is just a couple days old. This is from Camellia. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, And the title is, uh, How Do You Comfort Yourself Without Food in Lockdown? And just as the title says, when you're somewhat housebound, what actions do you take to comfort and soothe yourself instead of addictive eating? Maybe you're no longer as hungry on this way of eating, or maybe you eat less regularly and are completely satiated when you do, or maybe you're trying to ignore the cravings. So what do you do to fill those long hours once punctuated by meals and snacks? This question is prompted by the sad realization that it's probably been a decade or more since I've had a really absorbing enjoyable hobby that wasn't drinking or eating. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that are working well for me. Hot showers and baths, doting on my dog. Oh, I do that. Definitely. Making a ridiculous blanket fort in the lounge to watch TV. That's on the to-do list. (laughs) (laughs) Bengal spice tea. Mm -hmm. Uh, Walking with music. If I'm energetic, strolling with a podcast. If I'm tired, Reading a few pages of an unchallenging escapist book, writing on this forum. And then things that are causing me more problems than they solve, online shopping, Mm, working obsessively, Mm -hmm. and scrolling. Doom scrolling. (laughs) And doom scrolling, uh, scrolling online news and gossip. (laughs) Yes. Anyway, this started a really good conversation and a bunch of people Mm -hmm. jumped in there. And I think that's, what's great about the ketogenic forums is, um, you know, you can see all of the responses and you have to sort of read through all the responses before you can post. Well, you don't really have to, but you get the chance to unlike Facebook where you only see the last couple responses to a question. And then you have to press buttons in order to see them all in reverse order. And so what ends up happening is people tend to ask the same question over and over and over again. And that's one of the reasons we failed on Facebook. It was like whack-a-mole. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> Facebook is designed to uh, to addict you to novelty. So right. it's not in Facebook's algorithm's goal to show you something that you've seen in the past. Yeah. And if you go if you go into a Facebook forum, a Facebook group, and try and find a subject you've seen before by searching for it. It won't Forget even be it. in the search list. Forget it. You have to yep. literally doom scroll and check every post. So it's really, it's not designed for humans. It's designed for advertising to sheep. So uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> we can't <laughs> say <laughs> enough nasty things about Facebook, but um, for some practical ideas, well, it's been a long time since I've, since I've had three meals a day plus two snacks. Right. That was something I did prior to keto. 
generally what will happen is I will wake up uh, and not be hungry and then I won't eat and I'll skip breakfast, I'll skip lunch, and then about 2 o'clock in the afternoon I start to get hungry and then I go make myself an omelette and then I, I'm i not hungry again for a while um, and then I, I have dinner at 7. So that's roughly, that's kind of my pattern. It's two meals a day, kind of. Um, but... Uh, I, I, I do have a craving sometimes for snacking or macadamias, yeah. and that can be a downfall. So, um, yeah, I I would uh, I would recognise that a snack is uh, is your body be- you're being you, you're bored, and so you you're snacking a lot of times just out of boredom for having something to do. So, uh, getting a cup of tea is a good one. Um, you know, you still you're still using. Um, you know, you, 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 you're uh, uh, addressing the oral fixation of, of sticking something in your mouth mindlessly, except it's a cup of tea and it's got no calories in it. So there's that. That's that's yep. one way of doing. It. Yep. Uh, new hobbies are a good thing. I I picked up carpentry. I mean, I've been dabbling in carpentry for a while, but you know, it, when I'm getting bored with uh, with reviewing um, uh, citation lists for my for my papers, I I go out and build a table or something. So. Um, how about you? What do you suggest? I have sort of the opposite problem. I have too many hobbies. <laughs> <laughs> the basic problem is I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up. No, neither do I. <laughs> yeah, so if I grow That's up. That's why I have multiple um, careers. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I have, you know, I, I could pick up my guitar and practice that. I could always use a little more practice. Mm-hmm. And I always, always remember that I could use more practice on a gig. When I screw right. something up. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, you know, I could have been practicing these past couple uh, of weeks. Yeah, 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 Franklin, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> um, and, of course, programming is a great uh, yeah. hobby. But I, I don't really consider that jumping into obsessive working. I mean, it is kind of obsessive, and I am sitting at a desk and doing all that stuff, but it's an extremely creative process for it, me. Especially it can be I'm, play, can't it? Yeah. It's play, yeah. It can be play, yeah. Yeah, I'm solving problems, you know. Mm. And if I don't have a problem, I give myself one. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. I make a problem. <laughs> no problems just to solve them. There uh-huh. you go. Yeah. Anyway, let's head over to ketogenicforums.com and uh, add our uh, suggestions to the list. Contributions, yeah. Yeah. So I'm interested. We've uh, we've got a guest today, um, uh, Amy Berger. Uh, yeah. a- Amy's a certified nutrition specialist uh, and a certified uh, a certified nutritional therapy practitioner with a master's in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport. Um, and she's uh, she's committed to education and nutrition, and particularly the ketogenic lifestyle. I'm interested, Amy. What do you do to 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 avoid snacking? online during these times of our plague 2021. Yeah. Hey guys. So good to see you and talk to you again after such a hiatus. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it really is. Um, so I, you know, even before the pandemic, I worked from home and I have, I live in a one bedroom apartment. So my quote unquote office is about 10 feet from my refrigerator. Oh, no. <laughs> my <laughs> office, my office is my kitchen table is my dining room table. Mm-hmm. So um, one thing I can say is that eating very low carb definitely takes the edge off. Like I don't feel Mm. compelled to go to the fridge every hour, every 20 minutes. So Mm. sort of having that fat based metabolism where the the sugar cravings are gone and my hunger is so well controlled. It's not that big an issue, but um, I am definitely a nighttime eater. You know, there's so many of us have those nighttime urges to, Mm. to eat everything in sight. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's it's hard. There's no magical solutions. I do think having certain hobbies helps. I mean, I, I'm a musician too, but I can't, I, I live in an apartment. I can't play my clarinet at midnight and let, you know, my neighbors might or might not enjoy that. Um, <laughs> so, but that's definitely keeping busy and keeping, keeping busy sometimes with things that you would not normally be eating during. Like if you, you know, it's it's all well and good to find a, a comedy show or some movie that you might really enjoy or it takes your mind off things. But so many of us are in the habit of snacking while we watch TV or, or while we True. watch a movie. Yeah. So if it's something more 
where your hands are occupied, like Richard, you were talking about carpentry. Um, mm. I actually bought a puzzle that I only have put a few pieces together with. But yes, some people when you know, a very common thing when people quit smoking is they take up knitting or crocheting. Yeah. And that's men and women, not just women. Yeah, that's true. Something to keep your hands occupied so that you don't, you you couldn't really be constantly reaching for bits of this and that in terms of food. Um, I, th- I think I think that's helpful, but it's it's hard. So I, I think reading, I but I'm a reader. I, I put me on a couch with a book all day and I'm happy. And I, I think we're less apt to eat while we read than while we're watching TV or watching something online. Agreed. So um, or like like you were saying, a cup of tea, maybe a cup of coffee or decaf if it's in the evening that if you want something while you read, you, you can find ways to do it that aren't going to give you a whole lot of calories or carbs. I I lost the ability to read for some reason. I, I I went back to school with good eyesight, and then in the first year, all of a sudden, I needed reading glasses. And I, now I only read technical papers, studies. So I've lost the ability to read for enjoyment, which is a shame because I used to love reading. But yeah. I've got I, I I need to reread some of my old favorites. I think that's what's going to get me back into it. But yeah, I agree. Sure. Yeah. Hopefully, when you're you know maybe can take a break from some of that, you'll be able to get back to novels or whatever it is that you liked. Mm. So, Amy, have you noticed that there are a lot of people um, who uh, sort of lost their way during the pandemic in terms of um, the ketogenic diet, and and you don't hear from them. They just sort of fell off the face of social media and uh posting and yeah are, are you seeing that because i i i see that everyone has had no trouble at all sticking to keto <laughs> and that there's been no extra stress and everyone's just sailed through perfectly that's what i'm seeing <laughs> um, i'm seeing sourdough recipes from keto people <laughs> i mean under under the best circumstances some of us have trouble sticking to this like it's a, some people do this and never look back and it's super easy sailing the whole time and then some people struggle even when there isn't a worldwide pandemic or when right. their their individual life and childcare situation and employment hasn't been thrown into total upheaval so yes people are definitely um you know, some some more than others. Some people are not having any trouble, but a lot of people are. And if somebody out there is one of them, just know that you are not alone. You're not alone. Exactly. Right. And uh, you know, we're the, this is a judgment free podcast. We are. Mm-hmm. You know, we 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 d- we're not going to tell you. No, don't tell me that you had potato chips. We understand. It's like yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing. Like you can't. You can't don't don't feel bad about it. The 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 self recrimination and the judgment and it's it's just food. You know, at the end of the day, it's just food. And this this is as, as all three of us know, and many of the listeners know, it's it is more than food. I mean, this is literally a life changing, life saving way to eat. But it's also just food. And if you've spent the last six months or the last year regaining some weight, or maybe your blood sugar is higher, you know, than you like it to be. The good news is, you know exactly what you need to do to fix that. And mm, when right. the time comes that you're ready to do it, you'll do it. You you know you're not going to be totally off the map forever. It just you have to get to a point where you're ready to get back to keto. And and if that doesn't happen for another week or another month. I still love you. Carl and Richard still love you. <laughs> of course, and it's like, true. it's, um, it's, I, I, I just think the, it, it doesn't do any good to self-flagellate and to feel ashamed and to beat yourself up. That's not constructive. No. That's not helping in any way. It's just making everybody feel worse. I saw a great tweet by Eric who said that, you know, uh, so you fell off the wagon and the next day you're up five pounds. Well, don't worry about it because that's, that's just water weight. And if you just mm. get right back on the horse, it's going to come right off in the next day or two yeah. and get you, off the scale, you know, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know where the wagon is. It's not like you don't know where the wagon is. Sure. It's right over there. You just fell off it. So, yeah. you know, it's not that difficult to just get back up onto it. But there's another thing, Richard, that you that you may be able to address, which is for for years when I was starting a low carb diet, 
I thought it was actually dangerous to constantly switch between ketosis and not ketosis. Cheetosis. Yeah, cheetosis. (laughs) And while it is, you know, not good for if you're trying to lose weight, of course, Hmm. um, is there any evidence that's at, that it's actually dangerous to do that? Or is that just the way our bodies work? you, the thing is, you, you're going to adapt when you go keto first. It'll take you a couple of uh, couple of weeks to adapt. Some people do it in two weeks. Yeah. Personally, it took me six weeks before I felt happy. But then, boy, oh boy, did I feel happy, and I was great for a long time. Yeah. Then I went off keto for a friend's wedding once. I ate half of a pavlova, and a pavlova, pavlova. is a is a sugary meringue. I remember, and that. it was at a wedding, and I decided, okay, I'm going to eat half this pavlova. It's a, p- a personal size pavlova, so it was about yeah you know, three inches in diameter. I ate half of this thing, and then I couldn't sleep for two week, uh, two days for forty eight hours. I could not sleep. My left knee was was like five alarm, f- uh, uh, keeping me awake and inflamed. It t- it was inflamed, but it was. It turns out I've I've had a meniscus injury there that I've had for a long time. I thought it went away. It came back as soon as I started eating sugar. So that's like a little tip. Uh, you know, you can go off keto, um, and but some some of the some of the some of the uh, the things that keto is keeping you at bay may come back very quickly, and you may not want to get off keto too often. But I, I agree, Amy. You know that 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 if you flag self flagellate, that's that's a pathway, that's a gateway to eating disorders. I mean, you, you, yeah. You, 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 as you say, it's just food. Yeah, it's energy and it's medicine and it's all these other things and it's a lifestyle, but it's just food. Yeah, and I will say, you know, it, you're right, and, and Dr. Westman is right. That's that's who they meant when they said, Eric, you know, Dr. Westman is right when he said, all right, you, you binged on carbs and you're up three or four or five pounds. It's mostly water. You didn't gain body fat, which is true. But if you're off the map for long enough, you will start to regain body fat. You right, will you start will. to re-trigger your diabetes to come back, your PCOS to come back. But again, like we said, you know how to fix it. And maybe mm-hmm. maybe you're not ready to fix it now, but you know how to fix it when right. you are ready. And um, you know when when you were asking about ways to hold off the the snack monster and mm-hmm. what what else can you do in the ideal world? The ideal scenario is we don't have any cravings and we don't feel a need to snack and eat when we're not hungry. That's ideal. Right. Yeah. But in the real world, and, and that works for some people, but for the rest mm-hmm. of us, I, I truly, and, and maybe you'll disagree, I don't know, I firmly stand by the fact that if you absolutely positively have to eat when you know you're not really hungry, mm-hmm. keep it low carb, because, right. or I mean, to the best that you can, because metabolically speaking, in terms of if, if you do have diabetes, if you do have some kind of insulin resistance issue, you're going to be better off snacking on the pepperoni, on the beef jerky, mm-hmm. on the cheese, on the roasted, you know, cold leftover roasted broccoli, on the macadamia rather nuts. than having the pint of ice cream. <laughs> Like right. metabolically, you will, and I, I don't want to scare people again, right. like it's so easy to induce disordered behavior, but the metabolic consequences of overeating or, or snacking on that stuff are very benign compared to binging on tons of sugar and starch. Totally. Like, like, and, and Dr. Westman, to borrow a Dr. Westmanism, he has said, and I've heard him say this to people when they say, oh, I'm an emotional eater. He says, well, can you at least not emotionally eat carbs? Yeah. Can you emotionally yeah. eat pork rinds? Can you yeah. emotionally yeah. eat pepperoni? Like right. that's 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 a good in between step, I think. If you're not ready to quit completely, can you at least reach for pickles and olives right. and you know salami or something? You may not lose weight. You know, you may prevent yourself from losing right. any weight that day or that two days or whatever. But but you're not going to derange yourself further, and you're not going to make it worse and harder to get back on the horse. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um. One of my go tos is uh, uh, Julie Bagel's Krispies. I don't. I don't even know if she sells these things, but the, you know, she lives just a couple hours north of me. Julie uh, Fox McClure from Fox Hill Kitchens, and sometimes she comes down and brings me these Krispies, which are she makes a, like a flatbread from her bread mix, and then. Uh, dries it out and slices it and then dries it out some more in an oven. Nice. So they're like crackers and Ooh, spread a little nice. cheese on that. I'm, che- I'm a cheese and crackers snacker. So 
So that's my that's my go to snack. We we do one here where where we get a whole bunch of seeds like sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds, but most importantly chia seeds. And chia mm. seeds, when you add water to chia seeds, they turn into a gel. Yeah. So so what you do is you you have these seeds and you add a little bit of water to it. You can add psyllium husk, you can add nutritional yeast, you can add uh, spices, herbs, you name it. And uh, you add just enough water so it so that it, you you don't want it to turn. You, you want it still to be quite thick. So it's almost it looks just not quite dry. And then you spread it out between two trays and you bake it in the oven. And what happens is the chia, as soon as the chia hits water, it turns into this gel, and then you bake the gel and dehydrate it, and that gel holds all of those seeds in place. And it's just a cracker like you would buy from any store, but wow. you can make it with your choice, your preference of uh, of seeds, and it's, uh, That's pretty it's cool. very nice for dipping into guacamole, yeah. I'm going to try that. Chia is magic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, the, Amy, the reason we uh, the reason we mentioned Eric, of course, is because you, you guys wrote a book, right? We did, yes. Since the last time we spoke to you, I think it was Keto Fest. We, we we interviewed you on live on stage at Keto Fest. Right. Oh my god, that feels like a different lifetime, doesn't it? It was yeah, a different it was world. Twenty eighteen, <laughs> I think. Yeah, and and uh, so you wrote a book. I noticed on the cover of the book, you're in the small font. There's Eric Westman, big font. <laughs> well, small font, Amy Berger. Up banana. You know, he he is the world at, out of the two of us. He's the one that's world famous. People yeah. people will buy the book because his name is on it. But um, I never I'm, had I'm my I'm picture on the, top of, on the cover of Women's Day magazine, for example. <laughs> right. Oh. <laughs> there, there is. If yeah, if anyone has seen the cover of the Woman's World, they, that was quite an airbrushing job, quite a feat of, <laughs> of, of photoshopping there. <laughs> anyway, but um, I, I, I did want to say something about the um, the pandemic and the you know mm. people having regained weight and or whatever is going on. You know, there's, uh, like we said earlier, zero, zero shame, zero judgment. Like, I, it's just food and we're human and we mm. have complex emotions and, and eating is something that is easy and inexpensive and it's, there's a reason we, we reach for that stuff. But at the same time, you know, again, even under the best circumstances when there's not a worldwide pandemic – People will often use the phrase, you know, I was doing great on keto, I lost 50 pounds, and I was off my insulin, and then life happened. Those two were life happened. Uh, well, when, yeah, right. when is life not happening? Like, like we, have to, we have to learn how to stay low carb when life is in a tizzy, when mm. the car breaks down, when the kid is sick, when you know, the boss yelled at you, we have to find a way to navigate those situations without automatically wanting carbs. But that right. being said, if you do eat carbs, okay, no big deal, you ate carbs. But these life always life is always happening. When is life not happening? So mm -hmm. we have to there's always right. going to be struggles, there's always going to be things thrown at us that are unexpected. And I, I think we have to learn how to navigate those or even even if you don't stay a hundred percent on plan can you find some middle ground where you may be you know you're 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 eating something that you might not normally but you're not completely off the map and the one day or the one weekend doesn't spiral into a six-month bender you know that's it yeah don't turn a cheat day into a cheat week exactly yeah do you call do you say you keep a chicken game or low carb I, I often use that word. I'm I'm low carb. I'm in yeah. ketosis most of the time, but I don't yeah. deliberately measure. I don't track. I'm I'm in ketosis most of the time, but like I'm not going to kill myself if I have a scoop of hummus, you know. So navigating life, that's a uh, that's a really good way to put it. And uh, I, I mean, we've talked about some ideas. Do you have any other tips in terms of um, if you're going to snack, make it low carb? Are there any other? things that you that that come to mind yeah i think i mean the, the way to make that easy and convenient is to take the time once or twice a week cook up a giant batch of stuff that's ready that you can just reach and grab or you know depending on your budget you don't have to cook any of it you can get a thing of mixed olives you know mm -hmm. a, a cheese tray that's even pre-sliced for you um right. a rotisserie chicken go, go to good. your supermarkets so, some of them still have salad bars some don't but <laughs> there's so many things that are prepared 
that you don't even have to cook if you don't want to. But I think that's, I think it's, it is good to have a bunch of cooked protein on hand. And if like, Mm -hmm. I don't mind eating cold food, I could eat a steak cut up into strips cold and dip it in blue cheese dressing. And I'm a happy camper, but that you have to make low carb foods as convenient and accessible as the high carb stuff is. And if you, if you have a bunch of it on hand, ready to go, then it is. If you can reach into the fridge and grab a strip of green pepper, that's no more inconvenient. That's no more difficult than sticking your hand in a box of cereal. Exactly. I'm going to give the listeners a challenge right now. Go to your grocery store, get a $6 rotisserie chicken, as Amy just said. Take off the meat, put shred that up with your fingers in a bowl, add your favorite salad dressing, mayonnaise, whatever, celery, make some chicken salad. Take the bones and the uh, skin, cover it in water, simmer it with some herbs and salt, and now you have chicken soup and chicken salad. And when you uh, want to snack, get a, like a slice of provolone cheese, which is a great holder for chicken salad. Wrap a little in that, and you got a chicken salad taco, baby. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Nice. And with chicken soup, which is With awesome. chicken soup, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. I'm getting hungry. I'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so back to the book, Amy. The, uh, what was that experience like? Because I'm in the process of uh, working on my own book, and uh, it sounds like a lot of hard work. Well, at least for me, it's it's been yeah. a, it's been a lot of hard work. And I, we all know that you did all the work. Eric didn't do any of it. Eric, <laughs> Eric, <laughs> well, Eric put his name on the cover. We know that. <laughs> no comment. No comment there. Um, no, that it was a joint effort. In that, I I did a significant portion of the writing, but so much of what I know is because I learned it from him, right? Oh, he's, totally. he's one of the grandfathers of this movement. I mean, he I wouldn't have been is. able to write the book without without the research that he's conducted for 20 years. And um, so it, I would say it was a joint effort. And the book is called End Your Carb Confusion, for those that are interested. And the audio version just came out recently. We had so many. Nice. So it's a paperback. It's Kindle. We had a lot of requests for audio. The audio version is finally in existence. But yeah. um, it's it's the book, I think that we would want if we, if like there's so much crazy information and and misleading and and inaccurate information out there about how to eat this way and so i think what we tried to do is write the book that we would want if we were brand new to this if i was right. brand, if i if i was 100 pounds overweight if i had type 2 diabetes how would i want someone to explain keto to me yeah, and I I hope yeah. that's what we that's what we did. But in terms of the difficulty, you know, you asked if it was a difficult thing. I'm I am a nutritionist, but I, I consider myself a writer first, so I love to do it. It's it is difficult. It's very solitary work, um, and it's th- there's nothing more intimidating than a blank page. Totally, than a blank <laughs> page staring you in the face. But once you start putting words on it, and then. Once the book is out and people love it and they they give you feedback, it's it's worth it. But the the writing process and and the editing, the back and forth. But I mean, we we published with Victory Belt and they were so kind and so accommodating and and made us change very little. I think they were pretty happy with the manuscript. But um, just just going back and forth and your eyeballs start to glaze over when you've read your own manuscript for the fourth time, looking for Gosh. every last little typo. Yeah, but it's it is worth it. It's the, the it's worth doing the process. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I've got uh, I've got the meat of all of my chapters in place, but uh, the the thesis of of my book is um, uh, why is a fat man hungry? And it's a a, a bunch of paradoxes, um, such as I mean, if you look at a fat man, he's obviously has plenty of energy on on him on his body. Why is that guy lazy and hungry? What, what's the reason behind that? Because he's obviously full of energy, you would think. So, so this is the 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 this. Uh, it's a, it's a bunch of um, biochemical paradoxes and some uh, explanations for context that can explain away the paradoxes. So, well, um, I'm so glad yeah. you said because you gave a talk with that title at Keto I Fest, I think I last did, time, yeah. and I love that title. So I'm glad to hear that that's going to yeah. be part of it's, the book. Yeah, it's going to be a book. Yep. Absolutely. I loved your talk at Keto Fest 2019, <laughs> mm. which was really along the lines of what we're talking about now. Uh, 
just acknowledging the fact that, you know, you're human and uh, don't beat yourself up. Um, it was, it was, uh, to, you know, you take a risk and you take a chance by putting yourself out there as somebody who, you know, has fallen off the horse and, uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not a, a, a popular position and, you know, you make people squirm well, sometimes, but you know, it, the, the, the end result is like, we get it, you know, we relate. We can relate to that. It's it's not popular, but the only it's so so common, and the mm. only reason people don't think it's common is because everybody's too ashamed to talk about it. Right. And you know, if if you look on most social media, you think everybody is just losing weight, and everybody is fasting all the time. They're never hungry. They. Um, they're they're always in a good mood because keto is just so great and 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 there's a lot of judgment you know i can't did you see what that mother was feeding her child oh my god i can't I know, believe right. there and there's so much horrible holiness wrapped up in all this and heaven forbid you're having a hard time and heaven forbid you know about keto you know it works and you're just having trouble sticking to it we people need to hear that this is so common, and the only reason you don't know it's common is because everybody's too embarrassed to talk to speak up about it. Yeah, and um, you know, keto. It's I don't know. It's there, there's a lot of people struggling, even even before COVID. It's not the it's not always the easiest thing to stick to. I mean, some some people think it is, but just um, there's. If if you are having a hard time, you're you're not the only one, and and that that cannot be said enough. Because like I said, if you look on Twitter, you look on Instagram, and everybody's posting these pictures of their food and their six pack abs, that's that's the the tiniest microcosm of the rest of what's going on in all this. Right? Yeah. Don't compare your you don't compare somebody else's front of house with your messy backstage because exactly. uh, you know they also have a messy backstage. They're just not showing it to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. Well, Amy, uh, thank you very much for being with us today, and and I'm sure all the listeners really appreciate hearing your voice too. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to see you again. You too. Good to see you again, Amy. All right. Well, take care, guys. Let me know when this is out. I'll be happy to share it. All right. Bye bye. All right, Richard. I think uh, the floor is yours for bullshit. Bullshit. <laughs> How do you spell that, Carl? Oh, well, it's B O O L S H E E T. How do you spell it, Richard? That's the only way to spell it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, last episode on bullshit, we spoke about how calories out is not in your control if your insulin is consistently high, and restricting intake of fuel is futile if you can't turn that fuel into energy. Right. The bathtub analogy. Uh, yep. Food coming in is the faucet. Using mm-hmm. energy is water going down the drain. Mm-hmm. And high insulin is like a face washer stuck in the drain, inhibiting you from turning fuel into energy. Right. And all the water over the floor is metabolic dysfunction. It doesn't matter if you're in that state, how much you restrict the flow of force from the faucet into the bathtub, it still won't empty until you pull the face washer out of the drain. And then it doesn't matter how hard you turn on the, the taps, the bathtub doesn't overflow while the drain is open. So what bullshit are we going to talk about today, Richard? Uh, I'm going to stick with the theme of calories out and talk, talk about exercise. Ah, is exercise bullshit then? No, not at all. Exercise is one of the signals that we can give our body to encourage it to adapt. Our bodies are remarkable machines that adapt to whatever signals we give them. If we eat three high-carb meals a day plus snacks, then there's a very good chance we'll adapt by becoming metabolically deranged. So if you exercise more, then you use more energy and you'll lose more weight? No, no, that's bullshit. (laughs) Uh, It's a way of imposing a simplistic linear formula on a process that's just not linear. It's complex. Let me explain. So you know Stephen Finney, who we've interviewed multiple times? Yeah, he's been the principal investigator in many studies that showed just how uh, effective a ketogenic diet is to reverse type 2 diabetes. Right. Well, Dr. Finney wasn't always a low-carb researcher. He's done a lot of studies into athletes and obese people on just generic weight loss diets. In 1988, he did a study with Elliot Danforth called Effects of Aerobic Exercise on Energy Expenditure and Nitrogen Balance During Very Low-Carbohydrate Dieting. 
and we'll put mm. the link in the show notes. Okay. He locked 12 overweight patients in a metabolic ward for four to five weeks where every single calorie they ate and expended could be measured. Mm. The participants were fed 720 kilocalories a day with enough protein to maintain muscle mass, which is roughly one and a half uh, grams of protein per kilogram of ideal body weight and 0.5 of a gram per kilogram of carbohydrates. Mm, that sounds like a protein sparing modified fast. Yeah, it's it's kind of similar, and, and those are another kind of bullshit. That as are the eight hundred calorie diets and low fat diets. But we'll go into more detail on those on another day. Okay. But for now, what these researchers were doing was making sure that the participants were under a severe energy stress while doing while not doing permanent damage to them. So 12 people under severe energy balance stress. Um, the candidates were then randomly split into two groups of six subjects each. Uh, the control group were completely sedentary the entire time. They sat in the mm -hmm. couch and, and watched TV. The mm -hmm. intervention group, however, performed over the four to five weeks, 27 hours of supervised treadmill exercise, uh, up to two hours a day. Uh, common sense would tell you that the in, the intervention group, the ones that did all of the exercise, must have burned more calories, and we know they ate the same amount, so they should have lost more weight, right? Well, that's some foreshadowing, kids. Uh, I'm <laughs> yeah. betting the exercisers didn't lose more weight. Controversially, both groups lost a similar, statistically si uh, similar amount of weight in four weeks. It was six and a half kilograms for the people who were doing the exercise, and the couch potatoes lost 6.9 kilograms. That's, wow. So how can the couch potatoes lose more weight if they did no exercise? Didn't, didn't exercise increase calories out for the people who ran on the treadmill? Actually, it increased the calories out in the two hours they were doing the exercise, but it decreased calories out for the remaining 22 hours of the day. The wow. researchers measured the actual energy use of the participants every moment of the time they were in the ward, both when they were on the treadmill and when they were at rest. So for the first week, the resting energy expenditure, the REE of both groups, dropped by 10%, meaning the amount of energy that their bodies used when they were just lying on a bed, trying not to do anything, dropped by 10% in response to you know less calories coming in. Mm. After the first week, however, the, the resting uh, energy expenditure in the control group, the couch potatoes, stayed at that, at, that, at that new level for the remainder of the experiment. So they stayed at 10% uh, drop in resting energy expenditure. Wow. Where it gets interesting is that the resting energy expenditure of the intervention group, these are the exercises on a treadmill for up to two hours a day, continued to drop by a further 17%. What? So, what apparently happens is that when you restrict your food calories via diet and do cardio for as much as two hours a day, it will have no net effect on your weight loss because your own body's homeostatic energy regulation mechanism will conspire to make you lose fewer calories in the 22 hours a day that you aren't running on a treadmill. So exercise to lose weight is bullshit? Bingo. It's bullshit to think of exercise as a way to affect calories out to alter your energy balance because it's more complicated than that. So you were saying that exercise is still good even if it's not an effective tool for weight loss. It uh, Sustained exercise does burn glycogen, doesn't it? So it, definitely if you go out and do some exercise, you're going to make a whole new glycogen that's going to give you capacity to be able to eat more carbohydrates. That's one of the nice things about being a cyclist who's type 2 diabetic on a ketogenic diet. I know if I go for a ride to school and back, that's 14 kilometers worth of exercise. I've made a, made a space in my uh, in, uh, in the, uh, made a hole in my glycogen in my muscles, in, in my large quads that are doing most of the exercise, they're nice big muscles, and they're going to be able to uptake a lot of glucose. So, you know, if somebody gives me a lint chocolate ball, I could, you know, I could go the 90% lint ball um, once after a bike ride, but um, it yeah. gives you a little bit of bit of leeway. But, uh, you know, Tim Noakes says if you need to exercise to maintain your weight, then you're on the wrong diet. Mm. Once you get the perverting eff effects of high insulin all of the time out of out of your system, then your body adapts to converge to optimize both available energy and the mobility that you need in your body, given the signals that you're going to give it. So mm. let's say that you run a lot. Well, it stands to reason that the heavier you are, the more effort your body has to make and the more potential damage you can do to your joints running. So your body will hear that signal and optimize to be lighter at the cost of having less energy available. So mm. running is a signal to your body, hey, you need to prioritize being less heavy. Yeah. 
It works with other signals too. If you regularly lift heavy things, you'll build a strong back and arms. If you ride up hills, um, you'll get strong quadriceps and gastrocnemi. Uh, the calf muscles. Calf muscles. I was going to say that sounds like an Italian <clears throat> pasta dish. <laughs> it does. <laughs> uh, if you swim, you're going to get a stronger core because you're going to be you, you're continually yeah. um, ba- uh, balancing your body in the water and yeah. using, using your, your core, core muscles. Yeah. yeah. If you fast beyond your body fat's ability to buffer energy, then you'll prioritize more healthy subcutaneous body fat. Look, mm. we we are just remarkably adaptive machines. That's awesome, Richard. And you yeah, know that's the, my bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that's a great takeaway. Is that uh, people think, and you hear it all the time. You know, I can eat these French fries. I'll just go for a run. And yeah, you know, while there may works. be, <laughs> well, you know, there may be some truth to it in in that you'll blow some holes in your glycogen so you can yeah. eat the fries but but it's kind of like revert the reverse order right you yeah. have to go to a for a run first to have a hole in your glycogen so that you know carbohydrates won't won't uh, affect you and yeah but put you, on weight. You, i mean if you when you think about it you've got roughly 120 grams of, of glycogen in your liver and yeah. maybe 400 grams in your muscles that's not let's much. say my 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 legs are probably um, maybe twenty percent of my uh, maybe twenty five percent of my total body muscle. Mm. Um, so there's maybe a hundred grams in my in my quads that are going to be exercising, and maybe maybe I I draw down twenty percent of, uh, of the amount of glycogen. So I've got a twenty twenty percent. Maybe I've got twenty grams. I can, yeah. I can I can I can deal with twenty grams worth of French fries. Yeah, it's not it's a not, lot. It's not many a French fries. Bites. So so. <laughs> Please, people, yeah. don't 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 ju- don't rationalize. I'm, I'm going to go for a run, and then I'm going to yeah. eat so a the, large everybody pack of French does fries it. from McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, everybody does that, but it's bullshit. So don't bullshit. Bullshit. All right. Hey, you know what time it is? It's time for a recipe. recipe. <laughs> and here with another recipe, another excellent recipe is uh, my cousin Carrie Brown. Hello. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Carrie. <laughs> Hi, Richard. How's life down under? Uh, we're in lockdown still. <laughs> you think? So, oh, so that laughter is delirium <laughs> at this point. A delirium. <laughs> what do you got for us, Carrie? I'm feeling a bit peckish. <laughs> <laughs> so on the last episode, we did the sheet pan nutmeg a cheesesteak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just close when us I, <laughs> When I was coming... Um, up with a bunch of sheet pan recipes, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I decided that one of the common problems or complaints that I hear is that people buy stuff for a recipe and they do it and then they've got leftovers, ingredients from that recipe and they don't necessarily want to make the same thing again. Right. So for every sheet pan recipe that I came up with, I then took those same ingredients and turned them into a completely different recipe so that you could either double up on your grocery shopping and have end up with two completely different plates of food. Or if you find you have leftovers, you've got something different to make with those ingredients rather than doing a rinse and repeat on the thing you just ate. Yeah. Nice. So, last episode's sheet pan nut mega cheese steak has miraculously turned this episode into cheesy peppered steak soup. Mm. So, that's what we're going to do today. Beautiful. Obviously, it's soup. So, there's a few more ingredients, but they're Mm. just a few more ingredients added to the basic ingredients that we used for the the sheet pan meal last episode. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, here we go with our cheesy pepper steak soup. You're going to get a large pan and you're going to heat two tablespoons of avocado or coconut oil over a medium heat. And then you're going to add your eight ounces of finely chopped bell peppers, four ounces of finely chopped onions, and five ounces of sliced mushrooms. And you're going to saute the veggies until they're just starting to soften. Then you're going to add a pound of your shaved steak. And if you're listening to this one and you don't know what shaved steak is, you need to go back and listen to last (laughs) week because we had a very lovely discussion about shaved steak. Yes, we did. did. So you're going to get your shaved steak. You're going to 
toss it into the pan with your sautéed veggies. You're going to season with some sea salt and ground black pepper. You're going to stir it all together and you're going to continue to sauté it for a further five minutes. Then you're going to add one and a half pints or three cups of beef stock. You're going to add one pint or two cups of almond milk. Mm -hmm. You're going to add a quarter of a cup or two fluid ounces of heavy cream. And you're going to add two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar. And you're going to stir that together well. And then you're going to bring the soup just to the boil. And once it's just you get those big bubbles breaking the surface, you're going to reduce the heat to a simmer. Once it's simmering, you want to gently and evenly sprinkle one and a half teaspoons of konjac flour, also known as glucomannan powder, Mm -hmm. over the surface of the soup while stirring very rapidly with the other hand so that you can quickly incorporate it throughout the soup. Lovely. Then you're going to repeat that process with half a teaspoon of guar gum. And when those uh, powders are incorporated, you're going to stir for a couple of minutes until the soup has fully thickened because konjac does take a minute. It's not like cornstarch or all right. the other gums, which like thicken when you look at them. Do you have to bring it to a boil to thicken? No. Mm-mm. Ah. Nope. Just heat. You don't have to bring it to a boil. It Great. just takes. It just takes a while. Which yep. is good because it's more forgiving. Yeah. If you're a little bit slower getting it incorporated, you, you don't end up with this big, like, dumpling of gum. Yeah. Um, then you're going to add three teaspoons of finely chopped fresh parsley. Mm. And you're going to stir in four ounces of shredded smoked Gruyere and four ounces of shredded mozzarella. And you're going to stir until the cheeses are completely melted. And then you're going to spoon it in bowls and eat it. That sounds delicable. <laughs> <laughs> and it couldn't be more different from our, <laughs> our sheet pan wow. cheesesteak that we <laughs> ate. In the last episode, or yesterday, if you've just done that one. So, that's yeah. um, that was just a little way to help you turn one set of ingredients into two completely different things. Awesome, Carrie. And now, if you go shopping for those ingredients, and you get home, and you tell your family, we're going to make... Um, yeah, you know, Philly cheesesteak, and everybody goes, uh, I hate Philly cheesesteak, you can say... How about cheesy soup? <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you and go. They need never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, cousin Carrie. As so that's always. it. Soup, and I, and it, it's already winter in in the Antipodes. So, Richard, you can do this now, and nice. um, we're just coming into soup season here. So. Hopefully, there is this like magical point in time where soup is good for everybody. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thanks again, Carrie. You're very welcome. All right. See ya. See ya. See ya. Hey, thanks for listening. We hope you get as much out of this information as we do in putting it together. Two Keto Dudes doesn't take advertising revenue. Nope. We have no benefactors with hidden agendas either. Mm-hmm. That's right. It's just listeners like you who keep our lights on. And there are a few ways that you can support us, all of which are listed on our website at twoketodudes.com slash support. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time on Two Two Keto Keto Dudes. Dudes.